So a lot is going on um, on ivermectin. Thank you for the invitation. So <clears throat> basically, I'll try to talk around. I'll start with key messages. So we have the the, the core concepts uh, clear at the beginning. I'll follow with uh, a landscape of what is happening. And then I'll try to provide some reasons as to why this is happening, what's the science behind it, and then finally, what I, my own views of what this is for NTDs. So the take-home messages, I have two slides first, and everybody knows several countries have already approved ivermectin as a, or even rolled out ivermectin as a treatment or even prophylaxis for COVID-19. That means it's included in several national guidelines. Um, however, the evidence base to support this is limited. Um, there is also abundant misinformation, misinformation and um, some of the reasons behind this is uh, initial contempt, or what I, I regard as contempt by some um, key opinion leaders, funders, international um, groups, then a lot of social media pressure, advocacy groups, and there's even a role for fraudulent data on something that happened last year. Um, the evidence that is coming up, um, there's both, there's positive and there's negative, but it's slowly emerging. And now WHO is looking at this under the guideline development group. Um, the second part of this is that uh, this, that is, this is, of course, um, leading to a surge in demand, which is fueling profiteering. It's fueling the proliferation of low quality products, um, fear of potential rerouting of donated product for um, the next examination program into this new um, not yet proven indication and concerns about sourcing API. And then there's also uh, room for multiple doses or high doses being used. And there's concerns about maybe this will open or show um, previously non-seen adverse events that could affect the acceptability of NTD programs. And then I'll, finally, I'll, I'll, I have a slide at the end about optimal dosing and how what's the interface between the diseases. So what's happening? Um, Peru was the first country to include this in the national guideline for COVID in May 2020. It followed um, by, uh, seems to have canceled the program in October that same year, although it's still widely used in the country. Bolivia followed suit in May 2020 as well, and they even rolled it out to as much as 300,000 people last year in a, in a single shot in one city. Brazil, being a federal state, has not a single national guideline, but it's been rolled out officially in several municipalities across the country. Venezuela was one of the latest in Latin America and included in the national guidelines on July 2020. And then this year, we have Slovakia, including this um, about three weeks ago in the national guidelines. On the same day, South Africa did it. And um, uh, the next day, Zimbabwe followed suit. So a lot of countries rolling it out. The other component is in misinformation. And I'll just give two examples. Um, one is very recent, by the way. This is from last week. Um, an Australia medical group received a cease and desist order to stop um, um, uh, promoting unproven uh, therapies. And then this one is from um, Korea, in which the National Regulatory Agency closed down 750 illegal online websites selling um, drugs, including ivermectin, for the treatment of COVID. There's been a series of statements from authorities, both national, international, and even from Merck about this. The first one came out in April 2020. Uh, it was the US FDA saying, please do not use um, animal ivermectin for human use. PAHO came out in June 2020. Um, saying uh, there was not enough evidence back then. This may already be outdated. Um, Mectisan donation program with the statement three weeks ago saying, reminding partners, please not to use donated program, no donated product for other indications rather than oncocer gases and LF. Mm -hmm. Then Merck came out um, just two weeks ago uh, with this statement saying that there's no scientific basis for ivermectin and COVID, and there's a concern about lack of safety data. Um, finally, NIH had revised their clinical guidelines several times, and um, just well, 10 days ago, they um, 
has said there's not enough evidence to recommend for or against ivermectin and COVID. So why? Why do we have countries rolling it out, misinformation and all these public statements? And I think um, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, there's a public health emergency of international concern, limited treatment options. We have policymakers and frontline um, um, healthcare workers desperate for options of treatment. And um, I'll try to put some other reasons um, on why this is happening, right? And, and the first is this um, in vitro data. In April 2020, there was this paper out from the, uh, this Australian group um, showing that ivermectin can inhibit the replication of um, COVID-19 in vitro at 2.5 micromolar, which is way above uh, physiological concentrations. And um, this led to what I regard as contempt. Many people um, came out say, to say um, the concentrations were too high. There's uh, not even reasons to do a trial. When actually, when you have a, a disease that has no treatment on one hand and a drug that is quite safe on the other, um, generating evidence couldn't harm anyone. So I think there was an opportunity to let that speak, but that was not um, what happened with many experts coming out saying that this is a short and dark, uh, this you should think twice before doing trials, um, and even mockery was out there. Um, in uh, Another ingredient was the Serge Spear scandal. And for those that don't know it, uh, I would recommend you read the timeline here, beautifully written by Catherine Offord in The Scientist. But basically, the um, um, an apparently fraudulent um, database ended up causing uh, simultaneous expressions of concerns in the Lancet and New England Journal of Medicine on June the second last year, followed by simultaneous retractions in both, both journals. But what less people know is that the same group had a preprint um, that came out in April last year saying that ivermectin would reduce um, in 80% mortality of patients in mechanical ventilation. Um, another ingredient is the Frontline Critical Care Alliance, which is much more new. And um, this is a group of frontline health care workers that uh, I think are generally worried about uh, how to help people. And they have done uh, their own evidence review. Um, the bit that is more um, contentious is that they claim that there's no need for additional evidence. The, in fact, they claim that conducting trials would be unethical because evidence out there is already overwhelming. This was presented in the US Congress um, in December, and this hit the media quite strong. And since created this second wave um, that we saw, remember the countries I showed there were countries in Latin America putting it out in May, June, July last year, and now countries in January this year. Um, interestingly, the Frontline Clinical Care Alliance also quotes the Sergius Fear um, apparently fraudulent database. And there's also um, a, a commercial interest, I believe. This is my personal belief, right? There's an increase in, in demand that has, if you look at the Brazil data, for example, from last year, there's this flat gray line here. Um, and there's been a 20 fold increase in demand just in one country. Um, if you want to know more, I would recommend you go and look at the stock markets of um, some of the people producing related products and what happens after these um, open letters come out. So what's the signs? Um, there is good signs coming up. Uh, there are 59 studies um, registered. I think Natalie mentioned some 35 still active, and there's more coming up. Um, there's good animal data from Pasteur Institute showing that if you treat a um, hamster at the moment of infection with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, there is a marked reduction in olfactory deficit in these animals. And uh, I think this elegantly proves some effect. Uh, this is seen at 400 micrograms kilo, but also with lower doses. There's also this elegant work from Argentina showing that there's a correlation between the Cmax achieved in um, uh, patients and the rate of viral decay. 
also small numbers, right? And then this is our own trial uh, published uh, last month. It's a pilot trial with very small numbers, but we do see a uh, reduction in the median viral load at four, seven, and 14 days after treatment. Although if you look at this, there's a huge overlap in between uh, ivermectin and control groups but still for hypothesis generation and to somehow shed some light whether additional data is needed, this was very interesting. We also see um, halving of the olfactory deficit, um, particularly in male patients, but in overall there's a halving, so 50% of those of the olfactory deficit seen done in the control group. And there's this data from Bangladesh coming out with 400 patients showing clinical benefit. There will be data coming out of Israel with 100 patients also showing clinical benefit and also showing reduction in anosmia. But there's, again, negative evidence as well. Everybody was waiting eagerly for this N equal 400 study from Colombia. And it's not been published yet, but there's statements by the PI showing uh, or saying that there was no clinical benefit. Um, there is now an evaluation ongoing by the WHO Guideline Development Group. Um, and uh, hopefully something will, official will come out in the next few weeks. And as I, what I see as the consequences for NTDs, um, I'll go in the last minute on the, what I see are key topics. And one is that for NTDs, this drug is used once a year at 200 micrograms kilo, perhaps 400 micrograms kilo, normally single doses. Those are advocated for COVID treatment, may have to use it more than once a year at high doses, what I call high doses, and sometimes with multiple day regimens. For prophylaxis, and there's people advocating for this use, uh, there's still to be defined whether it's pre or post exposure, whether you should use it more than once. It's also continuous use. You would have to use it um, periodically, right, or daily or weekly or in a continuous use. And they're still unclear whether we should use go for higher or lower doses. Um, another point is the interface between COVID and NTDs. This is just to remind everyone that if you're going to give um, high dose dexamethasone to someone in the tropics, please treat them with ivermectin regardless of its effect on COVID because of strongyloides. And we uh, don't have good clarity yet whether the warming everyone will make COVID better or worse. Um, but this surge in demand is also fueling worrying stuff like this um, study just published with a review of seven um, products in South Africa of which some of them contained undeclared substances, including uh, benzodiazepines, pregabaline, or antiplatelet agents, right? And, and some of them selling for $70. Um, there's also illegal sharing and, and, and counterfeit products in Latin America, people using veterinary formulations to inject thousands of people, including stuff that looks like ivermectin, but it's not quite ivermectin, like doramectin. Um, and this is the take home messages I presented before. I won't repeat them. And um, it's still yet to be seen. Um, it's rolled out, evidence is emerging, but it's not quite definite to support um, broad um, programs yet.